Hi everyone. My name is Myunghun Jeon. You can call me Phil Art, which means love art. So I'm associate professor in industrial systems engineering and computer science. So uh, even though we don't see you, <laughs> that's meeting you. And we are in a separate room and everything is safe. So our moderator, Megana, and I will take off our mask. So if you don't mind. And Megana, can you introduce yourself? Yeah. Hey, guys. My name is Megana. I'm a junior in computer engineering um, and am part of the dean's team. So we'll be helping out uh, with engineering open house. So. OK, so welcome again. Uh, like I said, I'm associate professor in industrial system engineering, but I also have Curtis affiliation in computer science. So I'm working in two departments. So today I'm going to introduce my lab, Mind Music Machine Lab, and a subtitle where arts and technology meet. OK, so before we dive into the research part, I can introduce myself a little bit. So. I was born in Korea, South Korea, and then uh, got my master's degree in cognitive science and worked in industry around four years and went to Georgia Tech. I've got my PhD degree in there and then went up to North. So I worked as professor in Michigan Tech for six years. I've got my tenure in there. And in 2018, I came back to South. So since then, I've been working uh, in Michigan, uh, at Virginia Tech. <clears throat> OK, so it's my lab. Anybody can guess what this symbol means? I already gave you some hint here, right? So the name of my lab. So this is Musical Note. And it's easier guess. What is that? It's a mouse, right? And then if we combine them, then that's heart. <laughs> Nowadays, we do this way, heart. <laughs> so my lab is called Mind, Music, and Machine. In psychology, we teach and learn human mind is here in brain. But in some culture like mine, in Eastern culture, we believe mind is here, the heart. So this is my basic interest, mind, music, and machine. And so my lab is called Mind, Music, and Machine Lab. And these are research areas we're working on in my lab. So we do sound, so auditory display, design. Sometimes we translate the visual scene like aquarium or visual art into sound. So for uh, blind people or visually impaired people or children, they can also experience this type of scene with more modalities, not just visual, but with audio and other sensory modalities. And we do research on driving. So automotive user interface research in the lab because drivers, their eyes, you know, heavily taxed on the road, right? So if we provide uh, some type of information using auditory modality or tactile haptic feedback, that would be great, right? So we do research on driving and we do research about assistive technology. Assistive means helping or aid. So we develop, implement a bunch of different technologies and why, right? For what? Why? Because we want to help people. And people, those who, who need some special care, who have some difficulties or disabilities, so we worked for blind people because we work on sound. So uh, that is really a necessary and important channel for blind people. And we work for uh, people or kids with autism spectrum disorder. So I'll, I'm going to introduce one of the projects for kids with autism today, robot project. And so in the center, I put the effective computing. This is a research discipline, and I have a book about this effective computing. So effective or affect means emotions, right? So we do research on emotional aspect of computers. 
or emotional machine, right? So you've watched a lot of movies in there where uh, robots have emotional expressions and emotional dialogue with people, right? So we do research on that emotion. And today, based on all this A research, right? Auditory and automotive and assistive robots, uh, I'm going to introduce and renaming as aesthetic computing. So it's about art and computing. So let me introduce that way. Okay, so if we think about the art history, we can learn uh, a lot of different uh, advancement of technologies uh, has influenced art and aesthetics. So think about movies, cinema, right? Or, uh, or taking a picture. These, these are art considered as art and really the technology contributed to this type of art, right? But rare or little research has focused on the effect of art and aesthetics on technology or computing, right? So that's where aesthetic computing intervened. So we define the aesthetic computing as the application of art theory and practice to computing. So when I say art here, what do you mean, right? What am I meaning by art? Everything you can imagine about art. So drawing, dancing, and playing instrument or singing, or a theater play, and film. So in my lab research, we're not just developing technologies, but these uh, include all types of art in our projects, so you'll see. So to me, when I say aesthetic computing, that's reciprocal interactions between uh, computing and aesthetics. So as we uh, just discussed, computing and technologies can influence art and aesthetics by expanding our perceptual dimensions. So like a cinema, or you can think of virtual reality, right? Oculus or Vive. So that really expanding our perceptual, humans perceptual dimensions, but also art and aesthetics can influence computing, engineering and technologies by expanding representations of computing process and structure. Okay, so based on all this background, I'm gonna give you around three different uh, project pillars or uh, project domains I'm working on. So the first one is uh, core the emulsive interactive sonification platform we call ESOP, <clears throat> like a writer, ESOP, right? So we wanna create the interactive sonification platform. And when I say sonification, uh, that is actually my major, uh, the focus of uh, my research. So sonification means translating the data dimension into auditory display, auditory dimension. So you might be familiar with the word visualization, right? So when we visualize, that means from the data numbers, we create visuals, right? So that is visualization. And when we say sonification, that means translating the data into sound. So uh, I'm gonna give you some examples. So we wanna make this type of an artistic and research design platform for interactive sonification. And we have some research questions. How can we develop this uh, immersive interactive sonification platform for design research? And how can we make mappings between artists and dancers movements and their emotional states and the sound and visualization? Uh, between the two. So what could be the relationship? So I'll show you. So here is the, the system uh, configuration. So we have motion tracking sensors. So as you see here in the slide, these are uh, cameras, IR-based, infrared-based cameras. So when artists and dancers attach the little dots, onto their body. And then when they move around, our cameras in, in the wall tracking the motion 
and gesture of the artists. And then uh, making visualization like you see here on the big screen and simultaneously making aesthetic music. So we call sonification. So their movement and motion is translated into sound parameters and then we can hear what they create based on their gesture. So we have this display words, visualization and sonification program. So this is really rudimentary, the first test bed project my students created maybe seven, eight years ago. So see what he can make with hoping. So did you see the anklets has small sensors on his leg, ankle? So these cameras here, yeah, these cameras tracking his leg, foot movement. And then based on the mapping we created, when he's hoping in front of the screen, he can play the piano. So some of you might have watched the movie Big, where Tom Hanks uh, or was casted. So he's hoping on the floor and then that can uh, generate some piano sound. We actually follow that. So created this interactive big piano. And we also worked with performing artists. His name is Tony Orico. He's working in New York and he has graphite uh, in his hands and then making gigantic drawing on the floor. So you can see here, right? So he's uh, drawing on the floor and he actually rolling here and there floor and then making this type of big gigantic, uh, he's called like pen wall drawing, gigantic artwork on the floor. But at the same time, we tracking his movements and uh, making visualization on the digital canvas. So uh, when he's drawing something, we have the first artwork on the floor, the paper canvas. And then the second on the digitalized canvas, we visualize this way. And then also simultaneously, we sonify his movement. So when he, he is you know, rolling here and there on the floor, we made some sound. So this is uh, the second testbed project of this ESOP system. And this is another project uh, in the same line. And my PhD student uh, wrote a, his dissertation about this dancer sonification. So we invited dancers, have them wear sensors. And then when they uh, make emotional gesture, emotional movement, we try to detect their own emotional states and then created emotional music. So we also use some type of machine learning and then our system uh, learning how they dance and then creating some sound. So the first one is uh, just music. We didn't match uh, with our sonification system. So this is expressing, this dancer expressing tenderness. Yeah, and this dancer, we actually sonified uh, what she danced. So this is actually a real time sonification our system generated. So it's not pre-recorded sound and it's about anger. So do you, do you uh, feel some type of emotional differences between different uh, emotion and different sound? So this is what he created as his dissertation topic and then uh, working on this domain. Ooh. Okay, so what's the implication? We created multidimensional artwork and this is kind of new presence of performative model of art rather than 
representational model. So previously, when we say art, we go to the museum or art gallery and the completed work is there, right? Displayed. And then we just see it. it's static, just representational. But in our case, when Tony Rico or other dancers, when they create something, it's real time and then performative, right? So uh, this is really changing or shifting the paradigm of art. So even though it's visual art, it could be, uh, you know, expanded to multimodality. And then also uh, audience can see what's going on as uh, performative art. Okay, and from computer science perspective or engineering perspective, we created this type of uh, platform or maybe playground for artists and designers so they can do whatever new experiment about art. So we have both meanings of this project. So the second project is about driving, so emotional driving. So of course, all kinds of driving uh, research is about road safety. So we wanna increase road safety, right? So traditional driving research really has focused on cognitive aspect, drivers, workload and distraction. But we also wanna see how emotional distraction, right? Emotions can degenerate driving performance and how we can intervene with dynamic technologies. So we did some research on this. So again, these are all uh, technologies, sensors and, and monitoring technologies we use and, and some of them we have developed in the lab. So we have facial affect detection system. We've developed three, four different versions. We use eye tracking system and we also use heart rate monitoring and brain uh, activity using neuroimaging tools, FNIRs and we plan to uh, do research with EEG system as well. And also because if we recruit participants and have them drive on the road, that's too risky, right? So we use the driving simulator. So in my lab, we use a couple of different driving simulators. So with this technologies, we did run experiments many times with emotional driving. I think we've done more than 20 experiments. So what's the take a message out of this emotional driving research? So when we uh, play music, when drivers drive, they're actually decreased driving errors. So see here, the orange box here, dots. So anger with happy music or anger with sad music in both cases. So whatever, either anger, I mean, happy or sad music, that can decrease driving perform. I mean, driving adders. Another interesting fact is, okay, if we play happy music and uh, this happy means the, the validated happy and sad music based on the previous research. So when they listen to happy music, even though they're angry, their driving workload, subjective perception, actually lowered. So, okay, good. If you're angry while you're driving, turn on the music. That was our paper title. But more interesting thing is not just about, you know, asking them how they feel or just observing driving performance, but we're also interested in investigating neurophysiological data. So, because if we ask something, then because they already participate in the driving, I mean, the experiments, so they might respond to, you know, for, for us to be happy, right? So they can lie. But this neuroimaging, how brain is activated or our heart rate, heart rate variability is different. That's really hard to uh, deceive, right? They cannot lie about their neuroimaging. So we used both uh, heart rate, heart rate variability, and uh, using FNIRs. FNIRs is really same as fMRI, but we can still uh, get the neuroimaging data from the prefrontal lobe. So if you see here, this is even more interesting compared to the previous research. So this is my another student's uh, PhD dissertation. So she had three different conditions. Of course, all of them drove, 
in the driving simulator. So one group of participants, neutral, and they didn't listen to any music. So neutral without music group. Another group, they induced, self-induced anger based on their previous experience. So anger, but they listened to music. And the third group, they also induced anger, but they don't listen to music. So anger without music. So the important part is comparison between these two. So even though you're angry, if you listen to music, then your heart rate tendency, right? Similar to neutral without music group. But when you're angry and you don't listen to music, then the heart rate is going up. So that means, oh, if we listen to music when we're angry, then maybe our heart rate goes down, you know, towards the neutral, right? And this is the O2 is oxygen level in our prefrontal lobe. So maybe that can uh, reflect the workload level or the, the emotional uh, regulation level. So see here, same. Neutral without music group, right? Two different uh, combinations between practice and actual driving. And then see angry group with music. So their pattern, right? When they practice and then actual driving, their pattern very similar. But if we see this group, the last group, right? Same as this group. Induced anger, but didn't listen to music then their pattern is completely different than these two groups. So uh -huh. the lesson, take home message is when we're angry, if we listen to music, then our neuroimaging data, right here, F nearest data, or here, heart rate data, go, goes back to the similar with, similar to the neutral people. But when we angry and didn't listen to music, then we really, you know, have something going on, right? Bad things and also driving performance significantly worse compared to anger with music group. Okay, so that's another uh, interesting experiment. But then you might ask, okay, what's the point? What, what could be the practical implications about this uh, angry driving and, and music effect? So what we can do? right, as an engineer. So this is the answer. Okay, this is another PhD student's work. So he created sonification mapping. So while we're driving, right, this driving performance, uh, actually all the numbers, right? So speed, braking pedal, acceleration pedal, and steering wheel angle, right, and acceleration, or jerk, right? Minimum, maximum on average and lane deviation. These are all numbers. So see here, my student's uh, foot, right? When he started to drive, that all these numbers are mapped onto musical parameters. So you can hear on the fly how you're driving. So these music really reflecting uh, how you're driving. So let me play. So as the vehicle speed, yeah, accelerate pedal depression is mapped to cutoff filter for the main scene. <clears throat> And then, based on how you're driving, different percussion sound is added. So it's all about mapping between your driving data and then musical parameters, and we make uh, algorithmic mappings. So like I explained, we can make sound about how you are driving right now. So it's it could be reflection. But also if we make this mapping, you know, inverse, right? Then we can generate sound how you're supposed to drive. 
So if you're not really eco-friendly driving, then maybe the sound could go, you know, cacophonous sound, and then you can hear some type of warnings or, you know, not harmonize the sound, so you know, oh, I have to drive better, right? So that kind of implications we can uh, extract from this type of experiment and implementation. So we want to combine driving performance data and then driver's emotional data. Like I explained, we have a bunch of sensors, right? And nowadays, you know, microphone and camera, those are all as a default in the vehicle. So we can just use that camera and microphone for uh, detecting users' emotions and then uh, make, you know, develop some conversation, right? It could be just vehicle or it could be in-vehicle agent. So we do a lot of research on in-vehicle agent as well. And like I showed, if we use uh, well-designed auditory displays or maybe real-time sonification, then that can be used to mitigate the emotional effects on driving. Okay, so the third next project and the last uh, project pillar for uh, today's presentation is assistive robots for children with autism. And this project was supported by NIH, National uh, Institute for Health. Um, we were supposed to design musical robots and physical activities for kids with autism. And we have some background here. So we want to promote their social emotional interactions. Why we're interested in that? Because by definition, people have uh, people with uh, autism spectrum disorder, many of them have uh, difficulties in social emotional interactions. And that actually in DSM-4 psychological standard, that's in the definition of autism. So that's why we're interested in this social emotional interactions and why we want to use robot because a lot of research has shown that people with autism or children with autism, they prefer interacting with animals, machines, computers, and robots. So we postulate that's because these are simpler and more predictable than people. So have fewer cues, right? It's not really complicated. So that's why. And then why we're interested in music, using musical robot for kids, because music is inherently emotional, right? So that's why we want to use music and dance and movement for promoting social emotional interaction for kids with autism. So again, we have a bunch of uh, monitoring technologies. So now at this point, you probably get some sense of how we're approaching all the problems, right? So we're interested in people. So my domain, research domain is called human computer interaction or human robot interaction. Or uh, in our department, IAC department, we have division called human factors. So these are all very similar human factors. So we are observing and monitoring people's status and their emotion and, and cognition, right? Using this type of technologies and then we want to intervene. When to intervene, with what type of technologies and how to intervene, that's what we do research on. Okay, so here's a three minute uh, promotion video about this project. Human communication is very complex. It consists of words, facial expressions, and body language. It not only involves informational contexts, but also emotional flows. For children with autism, emotions can be a mystery. Not only do they experience trouble understanding the emotions of others, children with autism often have trouble expressing their own emotions. Our goal in this project is to touch on this aspect, making that understanding a little easier, combining robotics and musical activities. Meet Romo and Darwin Mini. These two robots will interact with the child and with their surroundings. Romo can present many facial expressions, while Darwin Mini expresses himself through body language and gestures. The robots can express a wide range of emotions, such as happiness, sadness, and frustration, according to dynamic social cues. Children with autism experience their surroundings at a higher intensity than we do. Lights may seem brighter or sounds may seem louder. 
For our pilot study, Romo and Minnie will both go through a maze-like scenario. Here, they encounter objects that stimulate each of the five senses. The child observes the robot's reactions at physically partitioned stations. Let's smell it. By watching how these robots react to the obstacles in the maze, the children will build a sense of empathy with the robots, and will also learn how they can avoid or overcome sensory overload of their own in the future. Studies show that there's a strong correlation between the neural domains for music, emotion, and motor behaviors. Studies oh, also show that using genius. robotic therapies for autistic children is very promising. Yeah, we delicious. believe that by combining robotics and musical interaction, we can promote development in children's emotion and social wow. interaction. It's so soft. Along with scenarios that engage the robot's five senses, we will also create sessions where the robots react to music and to the reactions of the children. Different songs will evoke different reactions, and different reactions of the children will also generate new robotic actions. Therapy with other people can produce a sensory overload for children with autism. By using robotic therapy, the children will learn while still feeling that they are in a safe environment. Robots can be predictable and, in some sense, more friendly and approachable than adults. Wow, great job! We look forward to introducing our robots to more students. Okay. <clears throat> so, we did uh, many experiments with kids with autism. Um, and when we used music, of course, that made, you know, children's movement uh, smoother and they actually showed as we expected different uh, behavior patterns when they interact with a uh, human dancer versus robot dancer and they preferred uh, interacting with robot dancer actually compared to human dancer but you might think so because they, they are kids right they you know all of them prefer robot uh, actually that's not true so kids with, I mean, neurotypical kids, they preferred and did more activities when they dance with human dancer compared to robot dancer. So in the right uh, figure, figure nine, you can see the first three bars, subject five, 13, 14, they are uh, autistic kids. And uh, the last bar uh, represents neurotypical kids average mean. So as you see here, there's significant differences between neurotypical kids and kids with autism. Okay, so uh, that is uh, all of the projects I wanna introduce you today. And this video is actually another project. It's like a spin off from that uh, kids with autism uh, robot project. So because we work on a lot, kids and, and robots, so we created an after-school program in, in a local uh, elementary school. So we called Child Robot Theater for promoting STEAM education. So you probably you know learn about STEM, science, technology, engineering, and math. But when we combine this hard STEM content with soft art and design, that could be easier format for kids who might be in, animated by uh, this STEM engineering concept. So we call STEAM, so STEM plus art and design. So we created this robot theater, then I'll show you what we've done with elementary kids. Here at the Mind Music Machine Lab, we conducted an eight-week STEAM education program for elementary school children where kids worked on musical theater projects with a variety of robots. The program was split into four two-week modules about acting, dancing, music and sounds, and drawing. After each day's session, the kids could play with the robots. The acting module had kids casting a variety of robots as characters in the fairy tale Beauty and the Beast, making sample scenes for the story, and reading through the script with the robots. The dancing module involved kids learning about different types of dance, doing basic ballet arm positions with one of the robots, 
learning to waltz, and animating a dance with the robot using graphical programming tools. During the music and sound module, kids learned about fully designing, recorded their own sound effects for the characters, explored musical themes and their use in storytelling, along with sonification of robot motion to create music. The drawing module had the children learning about geometric shapes to draw the beast's castle, creating character designs for the robots, and drawing scenery with markers attached to swarm robots. Attendance varied, but averaged approximately 12 kids a week, with 25 unique children over the course of the program. With parental permission and the children's assent, we collected demographics information, and the children were interviewed after each module. After school program staff were interviewed as time permitted. Of the 16 kids we were able to get demographics information, there were 12 females and 4 males with an average age being 7.69. Children were excited by the program, happy to see us arrive and begging parents not to make them leave. After school program staff indicated that the kids were as engaged as could be expected for their ages, but were also quite distracted by the robots. We observed the kids showed particular affinity for touching the robots and enjoyed when the robots responded to them individually, for instance by saying their names. In addition to this, children displayed collaboration and peer-to-peer -peer interactive learning. In the future, we'd like to add more robust interaction by including voice assistants that better recognize the children's voices. We'll also explore ways to add more coding experience to the program. To learn more about our research, you can find us at try Okay. So, <clears throat> take a message overall by integrating art, music, design, and technology. We explore a new representation of computing process and structure, as well as expand our perceptual experiences. If you feel like it's interesting, then you can Google Mind Music Machine Lab. I have three different web pages, <laughs> old one, older one, <laughs> and new one. But anyways, you can find out that, or you can uh, email me, my name, myunghunjohn, vt.edu, or philart, gmail.com. Either email would work, and we can discuss more. And when you come to VT, you can join my lab and then learn and enjoy this research. Okay. So this is our usual lab meeting. And now this is our lab meeting with this COVID. So we do lab meeting on Zoom. And these work all, you know, done by my great students. So I appreciate them. And uh, thank you for coming today. And thank you for your listening. So I'm done. If you have any questions or comments, feel free to add that on the Q&A chat window. Thank you. Like hearing about music, like I grew up playing music a lot in my life. So like, especially with the different research projects, is there anything that really surprised you or often surprises people about like how music can impact someone in a certain way? Mm. Let's see. Yeah, I can I can say many words on on the impact of music on on people's life. So, for example, before I uh, returned to academia, I worked as a sound designer, professional sound designer at, at global company, and I designed a bunch of sounds for you know electronic products and home appliances and computers and in vehicle technologies. So. If you think at your home right now, you have washer or microwave, whatever, that electronic products generate pleasing sound, then that's what I designed. <laughs> Even when I purchased, you know, two years ago, LG washers, I found my sound still there. <laughs> I designed maybe like 15, 20 years ago, but they still use that sound. So I worked for LG Electronics. I designed for Samsung Electronics and GE, General Electric, Hyundai Motors and whatever, you know, name it. Uh, but if you, if you hear something like beep, beep, that kind of sound, that's not mine. 
<laughs> so that's kind of uh, uh, interesting. <clears throat> and when we work for blind people, right? When they get to you know navigating their uh, destination, we provide a bunch of different auditory cues for their navigation wayfinding that really changes their life. And even on the phone, right? When iPhone first came out, that really, that was life changing for blind people. Bunch of blind people actually enjoy using the iPhone voiceover. And we also did many projects to enhance that voiceover with speech, non-speech cue and other sound cues. Okay, we have questions. Um, that is so cool. And we actually have a question. So what made you most interested in conducting research on the effect of music on technology and people? Okay, that's great. So thanks, Hannah, for a good question. Mm, first of all, I, I, th I think I have to reveal. So my longest dream in my life was to be a singer. So <laughs> in the US, we have American Idol, right? Competition. <laughs> we, we also have that in Korea. So I actually went there and, uh, you know, the, in the competition, I went to the like third stage right before airing the TV. <laughs> so I was not on TV, but <laughs> so uh, one of the, the advantages of, of my status is I'm doing research on what I have passion for. So really there's no division between my life and my work, right? I mean, I know everyone doesn't like, you know, combine these two they want to work and then take a rest but for me this is actually good so i can enjoy i mean of course many times i don't want to work even on on the music research but it's better for me so that's really great for uh, my situation so i'm working on music as a research and also as an engineer right we can help people uh, with visual uh, impairments and also people with autistic uh, autism spectrum disorder. So when we feel like or hear something, they say, oh, wow, that's life changing. Right. And they typically ask, when can we get that in a market? I mean, that's a different question. Right. Even though we do a lot of good research, it's not necessarily mean next year you can purchase our technologies in the market. Right. That is maybe limitation of academic research, but still, uh, you know, we, we feel good when we make that type of uh, assistive technology for different people. Yeah, so to piggyback off of that, you were working at these bigger companies and creating music for these different products. So what kind of pushed you to say, okay, let me go more into the research side and actually um, work in this? Um. So and there are different cases. So sometimes the companies, like nowadays many uh, vehicle companies and audio companies, they actually come to the lab, knock the door, email me, hey, can we do some research about X and X, Y, Z, right? So for example, as a uh, specific example, <clears throat> so nowadays, you know, Tesla has, they claim they created a self-driving car which is lie. So there's no self-driving car in the world so far. And uh, they are either level two or level three, uh, partially or highly automated vehicles, but not fully autonomous yet, not self-driving, right? And then vehicle companies come to the lab, my lab, and then, hey, can we do research on infotainment or user interface for fully automated vehicles? which doesn't exist. So uh, they don't know what to make, right? And then also we don't know, but we can do research, right? What people need, what people want, and also not just target users, but also we can ask around uh, world leaders and experts. We have communities about auditory, I mean, automotive user interfaces. So we do research and then develop together what type of technologies could be there or should be there for autonomous vehicle, right? That kind of thing. Uh, but not just for industry partners, the good part in academic life is 
I can decide what am I interested in, right? What we can do as interesting project. And also my students can develop new projects. So we work whatever, again, whatever project we feel passion for. So we can create uh, projects and then dig into, make a paper and then demonstrate and sometimes show off different academia or industry partners and the, hey, we have this great technologies in the lab. You know, can you buy this or you want to work with us? So it's a reciprocal relationship. So sometimes it's industry, you know, uh, driven and ask us or we do something ourselves and then we go there. And also uh, another aspect is there's also research trend, like a market trend, right? You know, nowadays because everyone can purchase this VR goggle, right? Uh, Oculus or HM, uh, HTC Vive. So I think in HCI domain or computer science lab, every lab has this and every lab, you know, doing research on VR. <laughs> so that's not an interesting thing. Sometimes technology, you know, gives us whatever research uh, domain as well. So we do VR, a lot of VR research as well in the lab. We make, you know, haptic gloves and audio, spatial audio and driving simulation. So all kinds of uh, VR research in the lab. So I'm assuming there's people of different interests on uh, the call of different engineers. So like what type of engineers is your team made up of? Yeah, that's a great question. So uh, like I said at the outset, I have uh, appointment affiliation in ISC industrial systems engineering and also computer science. So I have half industrial systems engineering students and half computer science students, but that's not all. So <clears throat> in my lab, uh, I have a bunch of different majors and backgrounds uh, of students. So obviously, you know, music, sound design and visual art, performing arts and many students, uh, dancers, of course we do that kind of thing, right? And, you know, mathematics, mechanical engineering, and uh, electrical and computer engineering. So I have a bunch of different students. And also, I serve as a thesis or dissertation uh, committee for sometimes design department, sometimes music department, sometimes psychology department. And also, my background, my PhD is actually not in engineering. I mean, maybe half, because it's called engineering psychology. So it's psychology degree but still it has engineering there. And then uh, minor in HCI, human computer interaction. So I think doing this type of research, whether that is about you know, uh, auditory display or automotive user interface or assistive technologies, I think the, the major might not be really the, the constraint or limit, right? You can major in mechanical engineering or uh, electrical and computer engineering, but still you can work on all these uh, areas. So not just computer science or uh, ISE, not just HCI, because I have many different collaborators who work on the same project together, but they all have different backgrounds. But this specific domain has a bunch of different names. So you can actually remember these names, then wherever you go, what major you uh, choose, you can have some sense of you know what's going on. So it's called human factors or human computer interaction. And of course, if you're interested in it's human robot interaction and uh, interactive computing. So there's some interactive interaction, right? Interactive computing, sometimes called interactive or interaction design. So ID, user-centered design or human-centered design in, in design uh, area. So these are all, we do all the same thing, but from different perspective, whether you wanna be an engineer or you wanna be a designer or you wanna be a psychologist, but we can still work on the same project, collaborating with uh, other disciplines. Uh, if you have questions or you wanna see some lab videos, then uh, you can email me, myunghunjeonvt.ed or philart.gmail.com. So you can contact me and then I can let you know lab YouTube channel. We have Twitter, LinkedIn, and YouTube. So 
And we can also have a uh, one-on-one -on -one meeting. Yeah, if, if you want. I'm, I'm really reachable and, and accessible. So I meet a lot of students, you know, first year student and uh, prospective students. So you can just email me. We can have, you know, 15, 20 minute Zoom session like this. And then we can discuss different aspects about major, life, whatever you want. If they're interested in you know, chemical engineering, of course they do chemical engineering and, and minor something like computer science or design, right? Or human factors, they can do and learn different things. I think the more they experience in college, I think the better, yeah. I also had a double majors and I see maybe more than half, a lot of engineering students, they do a double major or sometimes triple, right? So one major and two minors or double majors and they also work in different clubs. And I worked, when I was college student, I worked in, you know, three different clubs, two music, one cinema. <laughs> yeah, <clears throat> so that'd be great. Thank you so much for coming. And yeah, uh, hope we can meet next time, maybe one-on-one -on -one or, you know, you guys join the Virgin Attack and join ISC or computer science and we can meet in person. Thank you guys. Have a good rest of Engineering Open House Week. We appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you, Magana, and enjoy Engineering Open House. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Have a good one.